Hello and welcome to part two of my video, looking at the games from uh, Chesh uh, Cheshire Junior Chess Club on Wednesday the 22nd of January. Uh, we're going to look at two games in um, in this part of the video, uh, two very interesting games, Well, uh, very well hard fought. Um, at certain points in the video I'll ask you to pause and consider um, a question I'll set, uh, and then when you press play you can see you've got the, uh, the answer correct. Uh, otherwise, we'll just uh, jump straight in. Uh, so the first game is between Ethan Jai and Gonzalo. So the game started with the Italian opening, a uh, very common uh, opening. And White played the move four castles, which is one of the main moves in the position. Black played knight f6 to attack the pawn on e4, and White defended with knight c3. Um, so yes, yeah, so knight c3 uh, obviously protects the pawn on e4. A developing move can't be bad. Um, but actually it's a lot more ambitious for White in this position to play the move Pawn D3. Um, and one of the ideas here for White is to play Pawn to C3, and then a long plan then of bringing this Knight on B1 over to the G3 square where it can participate on a, in an attack on the Black King. Um, so we'll play a few more moves uh, in this particular variation, maybe you can see what White's got in mind. So Pawn C3, very important idea. Um, White's hinting at playing d4 at some point in the future where he can capture back on d4 with the pawn. Um, also potentially White can expand on the queen side with the move pawn b4. Um, well, sometimes White doesn't play either of those moves and this pawn on c3 simply uh, just controls some, some central squares. d6. Now the c3 square has been taken away from the uh, White Knight, White decides to develop the Knight to d2 instead. H3, often an important um, move. White would like to play the move rook e1 in this position, as we'll see later, um, but rook e1 immediately might allow the move knight g4 hitting uh, f2. So often white plays uh, h3 first to prevent this. Now white plays rook e1. The idea is to bring the knight to f1 to g3, so the rook needs to move out of the way. Bishop e6. Okay, white decides to keep the bishop with bishop c2, very typical idea. This bishop might be useful uh, later on in the attack on the king. And also white opens up the potential later to play the move pawn d4, uh, which gains a tempo attacking the bishop on c5. And then white can play the further move d5, forking the pieces on e6 and c6, winning a piece. So black often uh, retreats the bishop uh, out of the way to get out of any of those tactical tricks. And now White carries on with his plan of rerouting the knight. So knight f1, queen e7, knight g3. And White's managed to bring this knight from b1 all the way over to, to g3. Uh, so why did he do that? Well, the main reason is that it controls the uh, square on f5. And if a knight can get to f5, uh, it's extremely dangerous. Um, it's extremely uh, da dangerous to place the black. Uh, the knight would be attacking uh, g7 and h6. So there's very sacrifices in the air. If white could bring the queen into the attack, then things could get very dangerous indeed for black. Um, so the game might continue, for example, rook d8, knight h4, let's make a, a move for black, b5, and then we get a knight into f5. We'll see that this knight on g3 is protecting the other knight. After bishop takes, knight takes f5, attacking the queen. Queen d7, let's bring the queen into the attack. And suddenly white's got the bishop, the knight and the queen kind of all all attacking all these these, these kind of uh, these, these black squares and, and, and white's got the immediate threat in fact of playing the move uh, knight takes h6 check which would win a pawn uh, due to queen takes f6 so yeah so if white can get a knight to f5 um, it can often be quite dangerous for black to deal with so um, so I know I've gone on, on a bit of a tangent there but I thought it was worth explaining um, this this other plan of c3 and then maneuvering the knight to, to g3 because a lot of players at the club are, um, are playing knight c3 in these positions which is um, which is a good move, it's fine, um, but, uh, but it's much more ambitious like I say to put the uh, to put the pawn on, on c3 after after we've defended e4 first. Okay so black played d6 here, uh, it's important to note that the fork trick doesn't work uh, due to the hanging bishop on c5, so white simply wins a piece, knight takes e4, d5, Knight takes c5, and white's going to be a piece up into that. Okay, so both sides uh, carried on with their developments. And white played the move queen d2, um, possibly hinting at, uh, at sacrificing the bishop on, on h6, um, which is an interesting idea. 
black um, decided to cut that out altogether, played with king h7 just to defend h6. Um, it's interesting to have a look at what would happen if, if black allowed bishop takes h6. Um, normally a move like bishop takes h6 shouldn't work, uh, but there are certain positions where it does, certain positions where it leads to a to a draw by perpetual check, um, but there are some positions where it's, it's just unsound. Um, Black could, in fact, ignore the threat here with move like bishop e6, um, and let's see what happens. Let's see how Black would defend now after bishop takes queen takes h6. So Black could exchange on c4, and now there's an important defensive move here for Black. Move knight to h7. Um, I mean, firstly, this gives the king a, a sheltered square on h8, so the knight protects the uh, the king there. And Black's also uh, effectively threatening to play. Queen f6, uh, hoping to exchange the queens off. Uh, obviously, black's a piece ahead and would like to exchange uh, queens here. So, this knight h7 is an important move. Uh, if black played another move like bishop d4, for example, um, white is in fact now just completely winning after knight g5. Um, white hasn't got an immediate threat, but, um, but black is so tied down here. Uh, black can't move the knight on f6 because queen h7 would be checkmate. The king can't go anywhere. This knight can't come back because of queen takes f6. So black's really tied up here. Um, and if nothing else, white could um, white could win the game by bringing this uh, this rook on a1 into the game. Oh, excuse me, uh, this rook here. Often a way to strengthen your attack is to improve your worst place piece. So white could play rook d1, rook d3, and rook g3, um, followed by a discovered attack and, and a win. Uh, there. Um, white can also bring this rook on f1 into the game by playing the move pawn f4, although it obviously has to move the king out of the way first. So, for example, if the game continued, bishop takes rook e8, white could play f4, and the fr is going to open up, as we'll see here, rook takes f6, destroying the uh, destroying uh, black king's defence. So we see how quickly black could go wrong in this in this type of position. Um, so knight g5 effectively is a big threat here for white. Uh, it's important that black plays this key defensive move, knight g5, with the idea of queen f6. And if white decides to play knight d5, preventing queen f6, another important um, move here for black is the move rook e8. Uh, simply with the plan of rook e6 attacking the queen, and then the rook could come to g6, for example, and suddenly the black king is looking quite, quite safe. Um, so white, so black could defend um, defend in that manner. Um, I'll just point out another potential mistake here for black. If black tried to move knight e7, hoping to exchange this knight off, uh, white could win immediately with knight g5, threatening queen takes h7, mate. And if knight takes f, uh, sorry knight takes uh, g5, and then knight f6 uh, is <clears throat> is an immediate checkmate. So the position is dangerous for black, but with accurate defence, should be able to defend. Um, so strictly speaking, King H7 isn't um, isn't necessary here, but I can certainly understand why Black wouldn't want to calculate all those variations and decide to just defend the uh, defend the pawn. Anyway, although later on the King potentially gets a bit exposed here as well as we'll see. Okay, so both sides have brought out the majority of their pieces. Uh, Black still got to develop the the light square bishop, but if we look at the white pieces here, White's developed. All of the minor pieces, the knights and bishops, the queens come out to d2. Um, so what should we what should we do next? I mean, what's what can White's plan be? Um, well, one of the things to uh, to consider once you've brought your minor pieces out is how you're going to get your rooks into the game. So the rooks on f1 and a1. I mean, what what are they going to do? Now, rooks uh, rooks really belong on open files or semi-open files, um, i.e. lines where there are no pawns or only one pawn. So that the, the rook has a lot of scope, um, and how we create um, open files is um, using a device known as a pawn break. Okay, so a pawn break is where you advance the pawn to threaten to capture one of your opponent's pawns, which would open a line. So if we look at this position here, a potential pawn break for White, for example, is move pawn d4. And then after White would exchange on e5, say we see that the uh, the, the d file would be would become open. Um, which would allow White to activate uh, his rooks on the d-file, say. Uh, another pawn break uh, in these types of positions is the move pawn f4, uh, although we'll see that takes a little bit of preparation for, for White, but uh, White could, for example, try bishop takes bishop 
followed by knight h2, and then the move pawn f4, you see, trying to trying to effectively develop this rook. So it's possible to develop rooks without actually moving them, just by opening the files that they uh, that you currently stand on. And let's say black exchange that, we can see now that this rook has um, some pressure on the f-file, uh, whereas previously it could only move from, from side to side. So the next phase of the, the game is, is once the minor pieces have come out is often about finding open files for your rooks. White played the move rook fe1, uh, which has the purpose of defending the the e pawn in the event of white playing d4. So a generally useful move rook e1 in these types of positions. And now white played the pawn break d4, which is a is a good moment to play this move, um, which which opens up the center and um, and leads to some. Um, some activity when white's uh, white's slightly better developed than black, so black still to develop this uh, this bishop here. So it's a good idea for white to open up the center here. A black exchanged on d4, and now a question for you: What would happen if black captures the pawn on e4? Why would this be a mistake? Well, it all comes down to the. Um, unfortunate position of the black king on h7 after knight takes e4, knight takes e4, queen takes e4, white has the move bishop d3 with a, a deadly pin there on the on the d3 h7 diagonal. Okay, so black can't take the pawn on e4. Black decided to exchange some pieces in the centre instead. Knight takes d4, queen takes d4, and then try to offer an exchange of queens here with the move queen e5 which white declined and dropped the queen back to d3. Um, I'd have been tempted to exchange queens here actually, I have to say, excuse me, after, um, after queen takes e5. Uh, white should be better in this end game because he's, um, he's slightly better developed and also has the move, uh, so could, could uh, develop some initiative here. I like the idea of knight b5, attacking c7, if, uh, if pawn to c6, then the knight comes this very active square on d6. And if black has to defend passive of knight e8, well, we can centralise our rook. And okay, black can push the knight back now. Um, but white just has some, uh, a little bit of initiative here. Uh, after pawn takes, we're attacking the pawn on e5. And as you can see, white's rooks are very actively placed in the centre, whereas all of black's pieces currently um, aren't on very good squares. So white's got a, an advantage in this end game. So I would have exchanged queens there. But um, Ethan decided to keep the queens on, play for an attack. Queen g5, and now white played um, the move rook e3. Uh, now we call this move a rook lift. We uh, kind of lift the rook up, move it forward, with the idea of it then being able to swing to the side and potentially attack the black king side. Often this is a very good good move, um, especially when the black, uh, especially when the, the opponent's king side has been compromised. Uh, but in fact, white had a much stronger move here. Again, based on the, um, the positioning here of the, the black king, hopefully we can see that the, the white queen here on d3 is lined up against the king, currently the blocked, uh, blocking uh, by its own pawn. Uh, so there's a typical um, tactic here, the uh, discovered attack e5 check. White moves the pawn forward, checking the king, also attacking the knight. Uh, if the king was to drop back, white would simply win a piece. So black has to block here now with bishop f5. Uh, blocking the check, attacking the queen, so white hasn't got time to, to take the knight here on f6. But instead, after a move like queen f3, uh, it turns out that, um, that black's still under quite a lot of pressure here. He takes the pawn, white has the move, rook takes e5, uh, attacking the bishop, which is of course uh, pinned to the queen. And if black defends, white can um, increase the pressure with bishop d3, and, and white's doing very well here. Um, in fact, black's, black's really uh, in quite a bit of trouble. Um, I should note here that, it, that increasing the pressure with g4 isn't so good because after h5 we'll see that uh, white can't in fact take the, the bishop anyway because of the pin on the king and black's h5 move um, threatens to <coughs> threatens to win material on, on g4 so so yeah so e5 check would have been a, a better move um, but so uh, Ethan went for the rook lift with rook e3 and now I think Gonzalo spotted the discovered check and, and dropped his king out of the way. White continued rook g3, attacking the queen. Queen sidestep to c5. And now white made a mistake. Uh, played the move queen f3. Um, clearly lining up the move queen takes f6. Uh, the g pawn being pinned by the rook on g3. Um, 
And white isn't concerned at all here about queen takes c4, because after queen takes f6, threatening mate on g7, black can defend with g6 for now, but after knight d5, black's king really is uh, extremely vulnerable now with the uh, three white pieces um, swarming over it. Um, and the game might finish queen takes e4, knight e7 check, king h7, knight takes g6. Um, and black's getting crushed here. Of course, because Beth takes g6, we have queen takes f8 winning material. So, so white isn't worried about queen takes c4. Um, but black actually has a move here which um, which wins material. Um, so again, if you pause the video here, and spend a, a couple of minutes seeing if you can uh, spot a move uh, for black here that wins, uh, wins some material. The answer, in fact, is the rather surprising move, knight h5. So white moves the knight, which was attacked out of the way. It's attacking the rook on g3, and we see that this rook, in fact, has no um, safe squares. Uh, and of course, the bishop on c4 remains attacked. Okay, the rook could go to g6 um, because the pawn can't currently take because of the uh, the pin. Um, but black would capture on uh, c4 after queen takes h5. Pawn takes rook, blacks win a whole rook. So now h5 would simply win um, win a rook uh, for a minor piece, um, which uh, which I didn't spot at all during the game. Uh, it's a slightly surprising shot, but you've got to um, you've got to always be on the lookout for these uh, these forcing moves. So always consider uh, always consider checks, captures, and also consider threats. So moves where you're attacking something because because um, it really narrows down the amount of lines you have to calculate. If if white doesn't defend the threat, then you just winning material for free, so you should always, always consider checks, captures, and threats. Uh, black played knight h7, and here now white retreated the bishop to e2. Um, I'd have dropped the bishop back to b3, I think. Uh, I just like the, I just like the bishop pointing at the black king. Seems more active to me. Um, but bishop e2 was played, and that's a, a decent move as well. Um, and now, unfortunately, the uh, players had to stop recording the moves. They got down to less than five minutes. Um, which is a shame because the game was getting quite interesting and there was a yeah a very exciting finish to this game. There was a, a time scramble and uh, and Ethan actually blundered a blundered a rook in a quite a good position uh, later on and, and Gonzalo was able to to win the game. So unfortunately I couldn't remember the moves to the to the rest of the game, but hopefully this uh, these moves that we have seen have been quite uh, quite instructive. <clears throat> so we'll move on to the uh, to our final game. Um, from from Wednesday night that I wanted to look at, uh, and this is our game of the day. Um, I think a very uh, very interesting game between Arian and one of our coaches, Andrew. Um, so we had an odd number of players on Wednesday, so Andrew kindly stepped in to play Arian, and uh, I think Arian played a really nice game. Um, I hope they got some good experience from playing a from playing a strong player such as Andrew. Um, so Arian had the white pieces, and instead of Bishop c4, the Italian, and bishop b5, the Spanish, which we've already seen tonight. Uh, Arian played d4, which is known as the Scotch game. Okay, white captured, which is the best move. And now white played bishop c4, so not taking back the pawn immediately, but playing bishop c4. Uh, this is known as the Scotch gambit. Um, knight takes d4 is, in fact, the, the proper Scotch. Um, and white can also play... The move pawn c3, which is known as the Danish gambit. So a few options here for white, but uh, Arian chose bishop c4, the Scotch gambit, um, which is a perfectly good line. And black played one of the main moves, bishop c5, so protecting the pawn. Uh, knight f6 was also um, possible um, here. So that's, uh, that's another story. Black played bishop c5. And white castles. The main move here for white is c3, and we've already seen this um, position tonight where uh, the move knight f6 is the correct follow-up. Um, but castles is playable as well. Uh, and here Andrew played knight g2 e7, which is um, it's an okay move, a little bit passive uh, for my tastes. I think black had two two better options. Um, one move is knight f6, simply hitting the pawn on e4. And I guess Andrew was a little bit worried um, about what would happen if white advanced the pawn to e5. Um, in fact, the best move here for black is to ignore the threat to the knight and play the move pawn d5 with a counter-attack on c4. And after pawn takes f6, pawn takes c4, pawn takes g7, rook g8, we have an extremely sharp position. Um, 
materials level, um, black's actually kind of ahead in development with this big these pawns in the center, um, but uh, but his king's obviously quite exposed, and this pawn on g7 is a bit of a fall in black's size. This is a very uh, very complicated um, uh, position, which if you don't know much about is quite uh, quite scary to go into. Uh, but I think a more solid move here for black would have been the move uh, pawn d6. Uh, a useful move anyway to develop the bishop on c8. Uh, and black intends to play uh, knight f6 next. And, and d6 obviously prevents white from um, from playing e5. So uh, so d6 may have been um, a more solid uh, more solid option there. Uh, we'll note that knight g5, for example, attacking f7 is a bit of an empty shot after um, knight e5, for example protecting f7 and also attacking the uh, bishop on c4. But okay, so knight g7 was played, and now white played move pawn c3, which is a, which I think is a nice move here. Um, it's a proper gambit. Um, white's already a pawn down here, um, and instead of trying to regain the pawn on d4, white says, okay, you can keep your pawn, but after pawn takes c3, knight takes c3, um, white's got quite active, uh, quite active pieces, got all these minor pieces on quite strong squares, and the bishop's going to hop out somewhere, and, and, and White's trying to take advantage of the fact that Black's a little bit behind the development here. We'll see that uh, it's going to take at least two moves, for example, for, for Black to get his bishop into the game. So White has to try and make uh, make something happen really before White before, <clears throat> before Black consolidates and, and makes his extra pawn count. Okay, White played the move bishop g5, an active move, pinning the knight on e7. And this moves uh, this move works here because uh, Black can't play the otherwise tempting f6 due to the, uh, the pin on, um, on the pawn there. Uh, black decided to step out of the pin with queen e8 um, and now white played the move knight d5. I quite like the move e5 here in fact. Um, one of the ideas of e5 is that the knight could come to e4. The other point of e5 is that in this position it should be obvious that black would like to play d6 uh, to complete his development. Uh, so one of the ideas behind e5 is that if black continues with d6, I want to take, and that's now opened up this uh, this file for my rook. Um, so the rook's very strong here on the open file, and these pins are now getting quite quite uncomfortable for black. So e5 is an interesting option, uh, but Arian's move is, is quite good as well, knight d5. And here black blundered, uh, played the move pawn h6. Um, black had to play um, knight takes d5 here. And the game might have continued. Pawn takes d5, knight e5. So black's not worried about rook e1, um, this pin, because black can just defend the knight with, with d6. And black's doing really well here. Uh, black's going to catch up with development and, and be, a, uh, be a solid pawn up. Um, in fact, after knight e5, um, the, um, there is a very strong uh, idea here for white. Um, well, a very interesting idea. The position's still roughly equal, but. Um, but yeah, this is, this is quite a um, this is quite an interesting idea. Um, I mean, pause the video here to have a think about what you might play as white. Um, if you get this move right, then um, congratulations. This isn't a move that I uh, that I spotted. I mean, once you've seen the idea, it's it, you know you, you can use it in, in, in other positions. But um, but yeah, if you get if you get this right, then then well done because this is this is quite uh, an advanced uh, an advanced move. Okay, uh, according to the computer which I um, which I use briefly to, to check this position, um, best move in the position is the move d6, um, which is a bit of a crazy move because black can uh, black can capture that firstly with um, bishop and the pawn, and black can also capture the um, the bishop on c4. So, so what's the point of this mysterious move d6? Well, the main point of it really is all about this bishop on c8. Um, White would really, really like to stop Black from developing this bishop, um, and also, as I pointed out, the the immediate rook e1 is met by the move pawn d6. So we, we call this move, this d6 kind of move, um, like an obstructive move. Kind of White's ob trying to obstruct Black's uh, natural development, stopping Black from playing d6. So if we check the obvious c takes d6 first, White can follow this move up with bishop d5, uh, which prevents um, b6 because the Rook in the corner would drop. And if Black can't play b6 and he can't play d6, then it's going to take quite a long time for, um, for him to get this bishop into the game. In the meantime, White can bring the rooks into the centre and develop some um, some attack with his extra development. 
So c takes d6, bishop d5 looks a bit unpleasant for black. Uh, if bishop takes d6, white can play move rook e1. Uh, and this is a very nasty pin. You see that the queen can't move anywhere at the moment. So, so black can't get out of the pin easily. Can't play the move f6 because um, it's still pinned. If black plays king f8, hoping for, for f6, then white could play knight takes e5 and f4 winning uh, winning piece. So this rookie one is, is quite nasty for, um, for black. So finally, let's check what would happen if black played knight takes c4, which seems to just win a piece. Um, well, white's got the very strong move rook e1, uh, simply attacking the queen, and the queen's got no safe squares. And in fact, black's got nothing better here than to give up the queen. Um, <clears throat> I mean, black's already a, a piece and a pawn up, um, and after grabbing this pawn, he's now a piece and two pawns up. And after rook takes e8, black has a rook piece and two pawns for the queen, which is worth 10 points. So black's doing absolutely fine in terms of material. Uh, in fact, is a, is a point up, I guess you could say. Um, but the position's very complicated because because uh, black's still lagging in development, um, and white's extra activity uh, is a bit more important here than the, the nominal material deficit. So a very complicated position, but um, but yeah, d6 would have um, would have been the correct response in that in that uh, in that particular line. So quite an advanced line there. So um, don't worry too much if that's not all gone in. But um, but hopefully uh, hopefully some of those variations made some uh, some sense. But black didn't, black didn't play knight takes d5. Um, black played h6, and I think yes, yeah, so somehow both players basically missed one of the the points of white's last move. Um, well, it should have been one of the points, is the fact that uh, knight takes c7 is threatened. So, so in this position, white should simply play knight takes c7, attacking the queen and the rook. Queen d8, knight takes a8, black takes the bishop on g5. Um, and normally in these kinds of positions, black might be okay. Uh, white's won an exchange, i.e. a rook for a piece, but this knight and a8 is never going to get out, so the knight should get trapped at some point. But uh, the problem for black here is that after knight takes g5, his king is really, really vulnerable. Um, white's queen is threatening to, to come out to h5, uh, h5 and then h7 checkmate. And if g6, white's attack continues with queen g4, intending queen h4 and queen h7 mate. Um, so black would be in a lot of trouble uh, here. Um, but yeah, both players missed uh, knight takes c7. And, and Arian played, in fact, bishop takes h6, which is a clever idea. Uh, I, like, I like the idea. Um, the point is, if, uh, if black takes the bishop, then knight f6 check is a deadly fork winning the queen. But of course, black doesn't have to take the bishop and instead took the, uh, the knight on d5. Her white captured back. Uh, and now black moved the, the knight, which was attacked on c6. Uh, if black takes on h6 here, g takes h6, d takes c6. Black is still a pawn up, but the, the king's very exposed. Uh, here due to the lack of uh, pawn shelter and, and white should be doing quite quite well in this line because the his attack's quite strong. So black uh, decided to play knight e5, uh, white exchanged on e5, uh, attacked the uh, the queen on e5, black played queen f6 with a, a double attack now on the bishop on, f, on h6 and the pawn on f2. So white's forced to drop the bishop back to e3, um, black exchanged, and black played d6, finally looking to get this bishop out on, uh, from c8. So the position's calmed down quite a bit. Um, if we take stock, the material's equal. Uh, white has a leading development. Um, white has a bishop, uh, the bishop developed, uh, the rook on e3, ready to swing to some squares uh, on the king side. And also black's king uh, looks a little bit um, weak. So all those factors are in white's favour. Um, but one of the factors in, in black's favour is the fact that this pawn on d5 is a bit of a, a bit of a hindrance to white um, for a couple of reasons. Firstly, it restricts um, white's own bishop. White's bishop would be pointing at the king, except this pawn's in the way. So, so often if you've got pawns on the same colour square as your own bishop, they can get in your bishop's way. It's often better to have pawns on opposite colour squares. So we see black has a light square bishop uh, on c8. And black has these pawns, these dark square pawns here, which just don't get in the way of the bishop. So, so potentially black's bishop is. So white played the move bishop uh, d3 to uh, point at the the black king over here on on h7. Black played uh, bishop d7, developing the bishop at last. And white threatened a checkmate with queen h5. 
Um, so obviously queen h7 is the threat. Uh, and black uh, has a couple of options here to defend. The move he played was queen h6. Um, I think a better move might have been g6. Um, if white plays rook g3, for example, uh, pinning the pawn and threatening a, a sacrifice on g6. So if black were to move the rook, say white would crash through, bishop takes, rook takes g6 check, winning, uh, winning material. So rook g3 threatens a sacrifice, but black can defend again with um, the move king g7, protecting g6, and now black wants to play uh, rook h8 and kick the queen away. So g6 would have, uh, I think, been a better defence. Um, queen h6 defends the checkmate as well, but after queen takes, pawn takes, we see that um, black's really weakened his own pawn structure now. These pawns can no longer defend each other in the endgame. Um, so white should probably be a little bit, a little bit better here. White played rook g3 check, forcing the king to h8. And we see now this king has no squares. Um, so the king's not in danger of getting checkmated because white just hasn't enough pieces left at the moment to, to attack the king. But in the end game, it's really important to um, to realize that the, the king is a very important fighting unit in the end game. Um, in the opening and in the middle game, the king kind of hides away behind all of its pawns and pieces, uh, doesn't want to get exposed to any attacks from the opponent's queen. Um, but in the end game, uh, because there are no queens left and the, there aren't really enough pieces left to to scare the king too much, the king becomes suddenly very, very powerful and belongs uh, often belongs in the centre of the board where it can uh, it can do a lot of damage, control a lot of squares. So here, Black's king's a bit sad on h8, um, out of the action. Um, and yeah, the position now really revolves around um, who's going to be able to activate their rooks um, more quickly. Uh, remember that rooks belong on open files. Uh, or semi-open files, so the only open file on the board at the moment is the e-file. We'll see there's no pawns on the e-file at all, so the rooks uh, would like to be on that one. Alternatively, half-open files are files where there's just uh, one pawn, so we see that the c-file uh, is half-open, so white would like to, to bring a rook um, potentially to um, the c-line. Um, and in fact, probably, the, probably that move would be the best here. I like the move rook c1. Attacking c7, black might play c5, white could take en passant. And we see now that white's gotten rid of this uh, this problem pawn now on d5. Uh, and now one of the advantages of bringing your rook to a half open file is that you can use this maneuver known as a rook lift. So the white rook moves forward from c1 to c4. And now it's got quite a lot of uh, scope um, in terms of uh, being able to shuffle left to right and potentially... Um, potentially harass the black position. Um, for example, if rook b8, then suddenly rook h4 is uh, just an extremely strong move, just ready. rook takes h6 checkmate, and uh, well, there doesn't seem to be a, doesn't seem to be an adequate defense to that uh, to that move. So, so yes, yeah, so this idea of, um, of swinging the rooks um, laterally is, is quite a, a, an important one to remember. White played rook e1, which, um, Although it makes some sense putting the rook on the open file, um, it it just so happens that here Black's Black's a well placed to be able to fight for the open file himself with rook e8. Um, and actually, some rook exchanges don't really f uh, favour white here um, because it would allow the black king to get back into the game. Uh, white played rook takes e8 here, which um, is quite a typical mistake. Um, we don't really want to be exchanging rooks here because after rook takes. Suddenly, black now has possession of the open file. Um, it might have made more sense for white to play, for example, rook g to e3, um, or even to admit his mistake and, and, and bring the rook back to c1. But uh, but rook takes e8 is a bit passive, and now and now black has the open file and um, is obviously threatening the move rook e1 check. If if white was to ignore that, then rook e1 check bishop f1, and white's in a dangerous pin here. Um, if you just pause the video briefly and just consider how black can increase the pressure here on the white position. Okay, the correct move here is, of course, bishop b5, uh, where we've we're, when we've got a pinned piece, it often makes sense to try and pile up some pressure on that piece. So black is now attacking the bishop on f1 with two pieces, with the rook on e1 and the bishop on b5, uh, and it's just going to win win a piece. In fact, black's threatening checkmate here, rook takes f1, so white has to give the king some luft. 
um, but Tier Black's, Black's won a piece and should win the game. So, so White's got to be careful about this rookie E1 check move. And decided to give the king uh, a safe scale of H3. But bearing in mind what I said earlier about kings belonging in the centre of the board in the endgame, um, I believe king f1 would have been a, a better move. Also preventing rook e1 check and bringing the king closer to the action. After h3, black's now more or less taken over the, the initiative and has a slightly better position. Uh, rook e5 finally attacking this weakness that we discussed earlier. The pawn can't be defended by another white pawn, so it's quite weak. Um, and then white played the move rook f3. Uh, with a counter attack on f7. Problem with this move is it allows black to bring the king out of the corner. We see that white's rook was uh, preventing the, the king from stepping out of the corner. Now coming to f3, black can centralise the king, and as we've said a couple of times, uh, it's really important to centralise the king in the end game, uh, as, we'll, as we'll see a bit later in the bishop end game. Okay, so now black's threatening to take the pawn on d5, so white defended. Uh, black started pushing his pawns, pawn b5. White has to move the bishop, also needs to move it to a square which is still defending d5, so white retreated to b3. And now black played um, the move rook e8, which uh, is a bit passive. Um, I understand why he went rook e8. Um, I believe he suddenly um, realised that white, um, white wanted to play rook c3, attacking c7, so black decided to, to go defensive uh, and bring the rook round to, to c8. Uh, in fact, black had a very strong, um, strong line here, which, um, which is quite an advanced, uh, advanced idea. Um, black could have played the move rook e2, rook e2, um, and if rook c3, um, the move bishop f5, which is um, well a very difficult move to to find. Um, and the point of bishop f5 is that black just wants to trap the the light square bishop in the event of. Uh, in the event of rook takes c7, rook takes, uh, sorry, rook takes c7, pawn a5, black's threatening to, to win the bishop with pawn a4. And we see that the bishop on f5 is uh, guarding the, the c2 square. Uh, and in fact, white can't defend this, uh, this bishop um, properly at all now. If bishop, um, let's say, white attacks the pawn a4, bishop d1, rook e1 check, wins the bishop. If uh, white played a3 say, I can play a4, bishop here, rook takes b2, bishop's trapped. They have a4, rook takes b2. Okay, white can defend um, the bishop for now with um, rook to c3, but I guess black's got a, I guess black's got several attractive options here. Um, and even the move pawn to b4, for example. Uh, this, this pass pawn, a uh, protected pass pawn on b4 is going to be uh, very strong. Um, possibly black can um, possibly black can um, force a break through here quite quickly. So, um, so yes, yeah, so, bish so this this bishop f5 move is uh, quite a spectacular idea actually. Uh, very difficult to uh, to, to spot, um, but it's important to try and stay active in the end game. Um, and Andrew's move rook e8 um, should have been met now with rook c3. And after then rook c8 defending the pawn, suddenly white's doing rather well. Uh, white could play the move pawn f4, start bringing the king into the centre. Um, and white's simply better here because of the um, the active uh, the active rook. Um, but white instead played rook e3, um, fighting for the e file. But this is a this is the wrong time to play this move. And now black, in this end game, has uh, has a big advantage uh, simply because the the king is just much quicker uh, coming to the centre than the, the white king. So after king f6, king f2, king e5, we see the black kings attacking the pawn on, on d5, and now black simply would, would like to bring the bishop to bear on d5 as well. Uh, white played king f3, and now black should have played bishop f5 um, with the threat of bishop e4 check and bishop takes d5. So this, this move would, uh, would win a pawn. Um, it's hard to play pawn f5 instead. I guess the idea here was to prevent white from playing e4, and black would like to play bishop c8, bishop uh, b7, again attacking this pawn on, on b7. Um, white decided to try and eliminate this pawn on f5 with a move pawn on g4. And here black played um, move c6, which um, which I don't really like because, like, like I mentioned, um, 
this pawn on d5 is a weakness, so c6 allows white to, to exchange that weakness off. Um, I think it would have been better for black to play um, something like, say, pawn takes g4, and then even a move like b4, um, which allows the bishop another route to get into the white position. So bishop b5, uh, bishop d3 could be a, could be a route in. Um, I mean, this is quite. Uh, I mean, many many people might look at this position and, and think it should be drawish because um, there aren't many pieces left. Um, but actually, Black's just winning this position. Um, White has just too many weaknesses to defend. The the pawn on d5, the the, the super active king on e5, um, we'll see. It's just basically impossible for White to defend all these weaknesses. Uh, the immediate threat is um, just to bring the bishop um, round to. Um, well, from b5 to d3 to e4 check. Um, so we'll see. It's kind of like spiral maneuver. Um, if white plays e4, um, allows the black king to come into d4. Now there are various ways for black to make progress, but um, but I'd like to bring my pawn to a3 uh, to allow my king into c3 and, and, and b2, for example. Bishop c2, a3. That takes, takes. Black's going to... Uh, attack this uh, a pawn and win the the a pawn in the game. So um, so yeah, so so Black's just basically um, doing very well with this king on e5, and uh, Black re Black shouldn't really swap off this um, swap off this pawn. Uh, so we reached a position here uh, where the uh, players uh, stop notating. So I don't know what the uh, final result. Uh, well, I don't know what the final moves were. I believe I believe Andrew won. I believe Black managed to win the game in the end. Um, well, this position's not so clear anymore. Black was a lot better, but uh, this position's less clear. Um, but yeah, very very interesting game. It was an interesting opening. Um, White had some chances in the the opening. Both players missed the the move. Knight takes c7, uh, which, if I remind you, um, in this position, knight takes c7 would have been a just a crushing move. Um, and then we reached uh, an end game where initially White was better. Um, but managed to kind of drift a little bit, um, allow Black to kind of grab the e-file, and then suddenly um, Black should be better with this this weak pawn. Um, and then they reached a, a bishop end game where again um, Black's doing very well with the centralized king and, and could have won could have won the d5 pawn by four. So um, so yeah, hopefully you'll have taken um, a few things from that. In particular, in the end game, it's important to centralize our king. Uh, and also to try and play against our uh, opponent's weaknesses and, and try and attack those weaknesses with, with everything we've got. Okay, so hopefully you've uh, enjoyed that. I'll see you all again uh, soon. Goodbye.